Hello there, and thanks for joining me. I'm Curl Painter Master Aaron Rutten, and in this video, I'm going to show off the new version of Curl Painter Essentials, which is version 6. Curl Painter Essentials is the light version of Curl Painter, meaning that it has fewer features than the full version of Curl Painter, which is currently Curl Painter 2018. Nevertheless, it still has a lot of great tools that you can use to create digital paintings. This version of Curl Painter is geared more towards beginners, and so it's simplified to make it as easy as possible to work with. I'll go ahead and give you a tour of Corel Painter Essentials here to help you get started with it. There's a link to download it in the description of this video, or you can go to painterartist.com and you can download the free fully functional 30-day trial. It's not very expensive to purchase. Once you've installed Painter Essentials and launched it for the first time, you're going to see the welcome screen here. This is just showing you what's new in Painter Essentials. There's some different tips and tricks and tutorials. Over here on the left, we can switch between the different modes. This is a very handy mode called Documents, which will let you create a new document or open a document. You can also open recent documents, or you can open document templates, which are set to standard print and frame sizes, such as 8.5 by 11, which is a standard paper size. Going back over to the left, we have Layouts, which can set the layout or the arrangement of all the elements in your workspace to a specific screen size, such as a laptop or a tablet. Beneath that, we have What's New, which we just looked at. And then beneath that, we have tutorials, which are some links to different tutorials for Corel Painter Essentials. There's also a gallery beneath that with artwork created with Corel Painter Essentials. And then Get More will give you access to brushes that you can add on to Corel Painter Essentials, as well as a few other things here you can check out. If we wanted to close this, we can click on the X. I'm going to go back to Documents, and I'm going to create a new document based on the standard letter size template. You'll see that our canvas appears here in the center, and then there's a few other things on screen, which I'll go over really quick. Our color picker lets us choose a color. We can click within this triangle and pick any kind of color that we want. We can rotate around the ring to choose a, a hue for the color if we want it to be pink. So it's kind of a three-step process here. We have our hue ring, which lets us pick the hue. Then we have this vertical axis here on the triangle, which controls the value or the lightness and darkness. Then the horizontal axis controls the saturation or the intensity of the color. Is it a muted dull color, a pastel color? or is it very bright and vibrant? So when I'm picking a color, if I want a sky color, I choose the hue first because I know that a sky is blue. Then I decide how light or dark I want my sky to be. I want it to be pretty light. And then how saturated do I want it to be? I'll go left or right. Is it gonna be a bright sky or is it gonna be an overcast sky? Maybe it'll be somewhere in the middle like that. And then I have the color that I want to paint with. And we can drag this color picker and we can move it over here if we prefer it to be over on the right. If we want to move this palette here, we can drag this from the top bar and move this down. And we can arrange all of this stuff as if this is our desk. There's also another palette over here called the toolbar. This has commonly used tools. Up here at the top, we have the brush selector, which lets us choose brushes based on category. Next to that, we have the properties bar, which controls the properties of each tool or each brush. And at the very top, we have the file menu, which are just standard commands like you'd see in any other application. We'll go through all of this stuff one by one. But before we get into too much, let's just go ahead and do some fun testing of our brushes. So let's go ahead and pick a brush first. Let's choose airbrushes, and we'll choose soft airbrush. Let's pick a bright blue color so we can see it. Let's go ahead and do a test stroke or two, and I'm just gonna paint back and forth, and I'm gonna use firm pressure, and then very, very light pressure. You'll notice that if I use light pressure, I get a very thin, transparent stroke. If I increase my pressure, it starts to get darker. And I can get a nice transition depending on how hard I press. If I choose another color like this magenta color, I can fade one color into another very easily just using pen pressure. Now this won't work with a mouse. You have to have a tablet that supports pen pressure. So I'm pressing down harder or lighter with my pen to get that varying degree of opacity. You can also control the size of a brush or the diameter of a brush. I'm going to go to Pens, Pencils, and Markers. I'm going to choose Scratchboard Tool. I'll select Black. And if I press lightly, I get a thin line. If I press firmly, I get a thick line. Now, if I want to get rid of some of the marks on the screen, I can hit Control-Z on my keyboard to undo, or there's a shortcut for it up here. And I'll undo. You can only undo so many times. The default is 32, so you have to watch out for that. You can also redo if you want to bring those marks back up to 32 times. Let's choose another brush. Let's go back to our airbrushes. And you may notice down at the bottom, you can see a preview of what each brush will do. So for example, coarse spray jetter will look like this. 
digital hard edge or a brush might look like that. But these previews are kind of subjective and they don't show you everything that the brush can do. So it's better just to select a brush and try it out for yourself. Let's try Fine Spray. If we click with Fine Spray, we get something that looks like this. If we use light pressure, it's thinner. If we use heavier pressure in the same spot, then it looks like that. But you can also change the angle of your pen. So for example, if my pen is tilted a little bit, I'm gonna get a different mark. And that's only if your pen supports pen tilt. So for example, if I tilt my pen this way, I can spray the pixels up. If I tilt it down, I can spray it down. You can see the icon of my brush here, that circle, and that line in the center is representing the angle that the pen is tilting. Right now the pen is pointed up. Right now it's pointed down. And I can spray downward. This is known as a brush expression. The tilt of the pen controls the way the paint comes out of the brush. Now up here in the top in the properties bar, we can control the way the brush works. If we made changes to the brush and we don't like those changes, we could reset the tool to its default settings. We can change from freehand to straight line drawing mode, but we'll come back to that in just a minute. We can change the size of the brush if we want it to be bigger or smaller. Just as well, we can change the opacity of the brush if we want it to be more transparent. I'll switch to a bright red color and I'll paint. And you can see that it's very thin and it takes a while to finally build up to where you can see it. Whereas if I set my opacity much higher, then it builds up very quickly and it's very opaque. Let's switch back to that Scratchboard tool that we were using earlier. You can get a list of your recent brushes up here at the top. So I'll go back to Scratchboard. I'm gonna select a blue color here and let's take a look at changing the size. You could pick a specific brush size if you like. So if you're doing comic books or line art, you may want specifically a brush size that's three so that you always have a consistent line width. You could also move the slider to adjust your brush or you could use the left and right bracket keys to make it bigger or smaller incrementally but my preferred way of resizing your brush is to hold down Control and Alt or Option if you're using a Mac, and then tap with your brush and drag the size of the brush that you want. So that green dot represents the size of the brush if I'm using maximum pressure. So let's say we want it to be this big. I'll let go of Control and Alt and I'll lift my pen up. Now my brush is that size if I press down really hard. If I want it to be a really big brush, I'll use that same shortcut, Control and Alt or Option if you're on Mac. Now I have a very big brush. We can also switch between freeform drawing, which is just drawing freeform, or if we want to draw straight lines, we can switch to straight line mode. We can tap and tap and tap and tap to make a segmented line. However, it keeps going and it doesn't stop unless you switch back to freeform drawing mode. That breaks the line segment. You can draw freeform if you like, or you can go back to the straight line drawing mode and start a new segmented line. That may seem tedious to have to go up here to the properties bar, and it is. So you can hit B on your keyboard to go to freeform drawing, or you can hit V on your keyboard to go to straight line drawing. And so I'll draw some straight lines, hit B to break that line segment, back to V, and then I can start it again. Now what do we wanna do if we wanna clear this big mess we made on our canvas? We could obviously do undos, or we could switch to our eraser, but it's gonna be much easier to go to select all, and then edit clear, and that will clear everything on that layer. Then we'll go to select none, to deactivate that selection. There are keyboard shortcuts which will make that a bit faster. Select all is control A, select none is control D. Let's switch to another brush. Let's go to a particle brush called Flow Flare. And you can see that the properties have changed a little bit. There's now a grain setting and a glow setting that weren't available on the other brushes that we were using. Grain will let you control the paper texture, which can be controlled down here. You can choose from all these different textures. And Glow will make your brush strokes look a lot more like natural light if you're painting on a dark background. So right now I have Flow Flare selected with this blue color. If I paint, it looks like that. It's very opaque. It does not look like natural light emanating. So if I do an undo, and I select the paint bucket here, and then black, and I click to fill my layer with black, and I go back to my brush tool, still using that Flow Flare brush. I turn on Glow, and I select that same blue color, now you can see that it builds up and it goes from light to that saturated blue in a nice transition that looks like a natural light source. If we turn off glow and we use that same color, it doesn't look as good. So you can see that the properties are going to change depending on the type of brush or the tool that you have selected. It's going to show you relevant features that you can use to customize that brush. I'm going to go back to the brush selector. Now we have all of our different categories of brushes over here on the left. And then on the right, these are all the different individual brushes within each category. So you can feel free to experiment with these brushes. That's really the best way to know what they're going to do. I won't go through every single one of them because that would just take forever. But we will take a look at a blender really quick. Let's go to Blenders, Coarse Oily Blender. 
this particular brush can use the grain. And so if I tap here and blend, you can see that it creates kind of a grainy pattern. I can control that grain by clicking here and choosing a paper texture. If we choose small dots, then you can see that the texture is a bit different. You can almost see that dotted pattern. We change that to something else, such as pebble board, then we get a different texture. We can, of course, just blend like this to smudge our paint around as well with these blenders. And there's different kinds of blenders. There's also diffuser, which is a little bit softer and less smudgy. These blenders are really great. Not a lot of art applications have adequate blenders like this. And blending is very important to the painting process. I'm going to do a few undos here. And let's talk a bit about opacity as it relates to a blender. Not all brushes are going to add paint. So in this example, this brush just blends paint. It doesn't put any down. So opacity is going to control the strength of the blender. If you want the blender to be much stronger, you could set it to 100, and then it's really going to blend everything very strongly. You can see it's very grainy, very strong. If I reduce that down to 1, then it's going to have hardly any effect at all. It's a very, very soft blurring and going out of focus if I blend over it a few times. If we want to reset that brush, we can just click reset and that puts it back to its default setting. And that puts it back to its default setting. Now let's go ahead and go through the toolbar. We have our brush tool, which lets us activate our brush and paint with it, depending on which brush we have selected. Beneath that, we have the dropper tool, which can sample colors. If we click on a color on screen, that color is selected in the color picker. So if I click on this blue, I get this blue and I can actually drag and you can see that it's selecting whichever pixel I'm clicked on here on the screen. You can also, while you're on the brush tool, just hold down Alt on your keyboard or Option, and that will invoke the dropper tool. So I could switch to a brush where I can add paint, such as the scratch board, and I could be painting with one color, hold down Alt, sample this blue color, paint with that, go back to that white color again and paint with that, and then back to the blue, and I can really quickly and easily change my color just using the sampler. Beneath that, we have the paint bucket, and the paint bucket can fill my canvas. Right now, I just filled that solid area of black color. If I wanted to clear this out, I could draw something like this circle here, pick a different color, select my paint bucket, and I can fill that shape with a color. You can change the color here, or you can pick it here. Tolerance controls how far that paint goes towards the line that you're filling. So typically, this default setting works really well, but if you lower it, there might end up being a gap between your line and your paint. And if you put it too high, the paint might start to eat into the edge, for example, if I set this to 99 and I fill it multiple times, you can see that that line is getting thinner and thinner until it completely erodes and then disappears. So we'll put it back to its default setting. Let's go ahead and go to the window menu now and let's open layers. Layers can be used in digital art to stack individual layers of paint or different objects in your painting and keep them independent from each other. The layers palette is very important. We want to have that visible and easily accessible. We can go ahead and drag that layers tab down to the bottom of this other palette here until we see that blue line appear and then we can let go and that'll add that layers tab to this one single palette here. We can double click on this tab to go ahead and roll it up or collapse it so it's not so big. And then we can move our layers palette over there so we can see more of our screen at one time. You can see that right now I've been painting on the canvas layer and the canvas layer is really just layer one. It's not necessarily the canvas the canvas is everything that you're painting on here. It's all of your layers together. So that name can be a little confusing. The canvas for me typically is just the very most background layer. So what I should have done here is I should have drawn this circle on a different layer other than the canvas. So I'm going to do some undos to get rid of that. And I'm going to create a new layer using the new layer icon down here at the bottom of the layers palette. And I'm going to name that layer circle by double clicking on it and changing the name. Then I'll select a black color. I'll go back to my brush tool and my scratch board tool. And I'll draw that same circle. Now that that circle's on its own layer, I can hide and show it. If I don't like it, I can delete it. I can reduce the opacity of it to make it semi-opaque, and I can even move it around. If I tap and hold here on this little rectangle icon, then I can get some of these other options such as the move tool, and this lets me move objects on a layer. So I could reposition that somewhere else on the canvas. I'm going to create another new layer. We'll call this dot Let's select a green color and we'll just make a big green blob. Now, if I reduce the opacity of that layer, you can see how it's interacting with the layers underneath. If I go back to that arrow tool to move it around, you can see that I can stack these layers and arrange them however I like. 
And this is one of the great advantages to working digitally. In addition to that, I can also change the way that those layers blend with each other using the composite methods. So if I want this to tint or act more like ink, I can change it to multiply. And even if I turn the opacity all the way up, you can still see through to the layers underneath as if this were a thin ink rather than a thick opaque paint. But I can also do effects that aren't available in real life, such as set it to screen, and then it can disappear except for the area that it's touching on the layer underneath. So if I move that layer around, it's almost like a light that's projected onto that line. So you can use these different composite methods in a lot of different ways to achieve lighting effects or shadows or tinting and glazing. I'll go ahead and just delete that dot layer. Now I wanted to show you layers because of the next tool in the toolbar, which is the text tool. We can use that to add text. And just like you'd expect, you can change the font and the size and the alignment and the color. If we select the arrow tool, we can then move that text around. We can make that text bigger, smaller, and stretch it. And if I want to edit my text, I'll go back to the text tool, and then I can change my text. Now if I want to get rid of that text, I could of course delete that layer. The next tool that we'll look at is the eraser. If I want to use the eraser to erase this text, because this is a text layer, it's going to want me to convert it to just a regular layer that's no longer editable. If I click on commit, then I can erase some of that text. I'm not able to erase that circle that's underneath because that circle is on its own separate layer. So I have to click on that circle layer, then I can erase the circle. I can also flip my pen over if it has an eraser end, and I can use that eraser end to erase and it'll automatically switch my brush to the eraser. And just like with the brush tool, you can draw with freeform or straight lines. You can control the size and the opacity, and you can use a hard edge or a soft edge. The next tool that we'll look at is the crop tool. We can use that to crop our canvas down to make it smaller. You just drag a box like so, and then you can move these corner points or these sides to get the exact crop that you want. You have to click on the check to commit to that. And there we go, we cropped off some of our canvas. The next set of tools beneath that are the selection tools and then the arrow tool here. These are all grouped together into a group. You just tap and hold on one and it expands to show the others. These selection tools can select areas. You could use those selections to fill, or you could use those selections to select areas of a layer, for example, on the circle. Then I could go to Edit Clear, and I could delete those pixels within that selection. So selections are kind of like a stencil. You can make multiple selections. If you hold Shift, you can add to a selection to make a complex selection, or you can hold Alt or Option to subtract from that selection. Now if I fill that, you can see that's the kind of shape that I get. There's other types of selections we can create. There's oval or elliptical selections. There's freeform selections, which will let me just draw a selection like this. Then there's the magic wand, which we can use to select within certain areas, kind of like the paint bucket. We can select the inside of this circle, and then we could fill that. And then we can also move selections and transform them. And then of course there's the arrow tool, which we already looked at earlier. Beneath that is the rubber stamp, which we can use to clone one area of the painting to another. So if I hold Alter Option and I click on the line here, then I can paint over here, and I can make a clone of everything that I'm painting over. You can see the brush on the right is painting what the cursor on the left is on top of currently. If we look underneath that, there's also a Dodge and Burn tool, which can make your painting lighter or darker when you paint on it. This is useful for retouching photos. Beneath that, we have Mirror Painting Mode. We turn that on, that creates a symmetry plane. I'll switch back to my brush and the scratchboard tool. And you can see that we can very easily draw symmetrically here. If we want to control that mirror painting, we have to go back to mirror painting and we can turn that on or off. We can also add an additional plane if we want it to be horizontal or vertical or both. And we can make it kaleidoscope mode where we can add different sections. So you can make really cool mandala patterns. So you can see each section is kind of a plane. You can add more or less segments and you can control the color of the guides. I'm gonna go ahead and turn that off. The next tool is the grabber tool. We can use that to move our canvas around our workspace here. Similar to how you can bring up the dropper tool at any time, if you're painting with the brush tool, you can hold spacebar, move your canvas, keep drawing, hold spacebar again, move your canvas, and you don't have to switch back to that tool. You just use a keyboard shortcut. If we click the zoom button, we can zoom in or we can zoom out. You can also go to the window menu and you can zoom in and zoom out. There's keyboard shortcuts for that. You can zoom to fit, to fit the canvas as big as possible in your workspace. Or you can zoom to actual size to put it to 
Beneath that, we have the rotate tool. If we click on that, then we can rotate the view of our canvas. This might make it easier to draw certain angles. If we want to reset it to upright, we just double click on the icon to put it back. Beneath that, we have our additional color and our main color swatches. Most brushes are going to use main color, so we don't need to be too concerned with this right now. And then last in the toolbar is the grain or the paper textures, which we can choose to get a different texture for brushes that use grain. Now you may have noticed that just like with the brushes, depending on the tool that you have selected, you're going to get different options up here in the properties bar. And again, these properties or these options are going to help you use these tools. Now let's go ahead and talk about this palette that's over here on the right. This contains photo painting, mixer, and color set, and I added layers to it myself. Let's just double click on photo painting to open that up. Now photo painting will allow you to automatically create paintings from a photo. There are varying degrees of involvement from having to paint over the photo in order to get the colors to having Curl a Painter auto paint it by automatically painting it for you. For example, we can choose a photo. I'm going to choose browse. I've loaded a photograph of some fireworks. We can try auto painting. We'll click start. It creates a new painting and it automatically paints it for us. And we can choose the different modes here if we want it to be more impressionistic. We can do that and click on stop and we can stop it at any point too. But the longer we let it go, the more detail it's going to add. We stop it right about there. I guess that looks okay. There might be a different style that looks a little bit better. If we experiment a bit, let's try illustration. I think that looks a lot better. It's a pretty cool quick painting from a photo. I'm going to load a different painting here of some mushrooms. And I'm just going to start and stop this really quickly. That way it puts in a little bit of background for me. Then I can click on show tracing paper and show tracing paper will show me a faint image of my painting so I can see what it is that I'm trying to clone. Now I can choose any of these photo painting brushes here. Let's try bristle oils cloner. What I want to do is just paint on the image. And what that's going to do is that's going to clone those colors. So if I turn off tracing paper again, you can see that I'm able to bring in that image. But it's helpful to be able to see that image so that you can see where it is you want to paint. So I could paint in just this dark area up here, like so. And you can see it cloned that area there. And essentially what I want to do is just paint over the entire painting. That'll give me a result that'll probably look something like this, except it'll look a little more natural because the computer only knows so much about the subject and so it's up to you to decide which direction the strokes should go. So what you could do is you could auto paint most of it and then go through and hand paint some more of it and get kind of a mix of the two. If you're having trouble seeing your tracing paper there's also an option to control the opacity of it here. You can also use the keyboard shortcut of Control t to toggle it on and off with your keyboard. The other palette that's hiding over here is the mixer. The mixer can be used like an artist's palette to apply paint to. If you want to be able to sample that color later, or you want to mix transitions in color, there's some sample colors that are already here. If you wanted to add a color, you could just sample that color using the dropper tool. And then if you click on this button here to apply color, you can put a little blob on your canvas. And then anytime you can sample that color or any of the other colors here. Now we're still on the cloner brushes, so to add paint that's not going to be cloning the colors underneath, we need to switch to a regular brush that's not a cloner. Let's say Real Oils Filbert. Then we'll have to go back to photo painting, and we'll have to uncheck clone color from source image, and now we'll be able to paint with that color that we selected. As long as this clone color from source image is checked, we're always going to be painting with the cloned colors. If we want to paint with selected colors, that needs to be unchecked. If you don't like this mixer, you can delete it and you can make your own. You can also change the brush size of the sample that you put down. And there's some little wells up here to choose common colors. Let's go to color set. This is a good way to get another list of common colors. You could think of this as a bunch of tubes of paint. So if you don't want to choose the color yourself over here in the color picker, this is a great way to get common colors. And they're named emerald and permanent green, and they have lots of names that you would recognize from traditional paint. Now, if there's anything in this palette that you don't find useful or you don't want to use, you can take it and you can drag it out. You can move it somewhere else if you think you might want to use it later and just kind of put it out of the way. Or you can go to the window menu and you can just uncheck it to close it. And then there's some other palettes that aren't visible right now, just like we brought up layers earlier. There's a navigator which we can use to navigate the view of our canvas. We can use it to zoom in and zoom out. 
or if we're zoomed in really far in painting, we can see a view of our entire canvas while we're working. Again, if we don't like that and we don't want it anymore, we can just disable it. We can bring up our recent brushes if we want our recent brushes to always be visible here. We can bring up the command bar, which has a few handy shortcuts that we can use, such as resizing our brush and altering our opacity on screen. And so you can use this as an opportunity to get your workspace set up the way that you want. I recommend that once you get it set up the way you want, that you go to Window, Layouts, and then Save Layout. You can give it a name, and that way if you like, then you can switch between different layouts and you have your changes saved here. Now, if you don't like seeing all these tools and palettes while you're working, you can hit Tab on your keyboard. That'll only show your canvas and your color picker. You can also use Shift Tab, which will keep some of the stuff open, but hide just the palettes. And let's just really quickly go through some of the remaining stuff in the file menu here. Under File, we have New, which will create a new canvas. Open, which will open an existing composition. Recent will give you a list of what you were working on recently. Place will let you place an image such as a photograph or an element into your composition. So we can go to Place. For example, I can bring in this apple. I'll just click on OK. Now I have a photographic element in my painting that I can use. It comes down on its own layer, and so I can control the opacity of it and I can control the composite method as well. Back to the file menu, we have close. We can close our currently active document. We can go to save, which will let us save our progress. Save as is very important because I recommend that you use it to save iterations or multiple copies of your work as you're going along. That way you have version one and version two and version three. That way if you mess up version three, you can always go back to version two and you don't have to start over from the beginning. As far as formats, you have the RIF format, which is the native Corel Painter format. This is a good format to choose for your working copy that you're creating. You could also select Photoshop PSD if you plan to use Photoshop, although Photoshop might not save some of the features that are Corel Painter proprietary. So just be careful when you're doing that. When in doubt, just save a copy as a RIF and then save another copy as a PSD. TIFF is a great format for saving high quality prints. PNG is a great format for high quality images posted to the web. JPEG is a very popular format, but I don't recommend using it unless you need to use it specifically to make the file size smaller, because in making the file size smaller, it also throws away some information. And then there's GIF and bitmap if you need to use those. Going back to the file menu, revert will revert back to your last save. So if I make some changes here that I don't like, let's say I paint on this and I mess it up like this, what I can do is go to file, revert, and that'll put it back to how it was before I made those unsaved changes. You can also email an image. There's page setup if you want to set up your page for printing, and then there's print if you want to print your artwork from your home printer, and then exit if you want to close Corel Painter. Moving on to the edit menu, we have undo and redo. There's cut, copy, and paste, and paste in place if you want it to paste exactly where you cut it from. You can paste something into a new image, or we can clear the pixels that are on a layer. There's also preferences, and then we'll choose general. And we can go through all the different menus of preferences here on the left. Let's start with general. I'm just gonna point out some of the important options here. You can feel free to experiment with the others. Create backup on save is a great one to leave on because it'll save a backup when you save. Then you'll have a copy in case something bad happens. Let's go down to interface. If you don't like the color of the background, you can change that to anything else you want. If I want it to be black, I could do that. Now if I create a new canvas, you can see that my background is black. Let's go to performance. Here's where you can choose how much of your computer resources Corel Painter is going to use. You may want to experiment with this because you might be able to get Painter running more smoothly if you optimize your settings. So memory usage, you want to be somewhere in the range of 60 to 80%. You can see how much it's going to use. You want to make sure that you save some memory for other things that your computer needs to do. And as it says, you can set it to 100, but that may not increase performance. In fact, it may make your performance worse. Multi-cores can use the cores in your computer if it's a multi-core computer. I have six cores in my computer, so I could set it to six, or I could set it lower if I want to save some cores for something else. Again, there is no ideal setting for everybody's computer. You have to experiment to see what works. If you have multiple hard drives, you can choose a scratch drive. That can be helpful for speeding up Corel Painter. You can also change the undo levels. I set mine to nine because I typically don't do a whole lot of undos. This can also cut back on how much computer resources are required to run Painter if you set this lower. As it mentions here, you can set it up to 256, but it will impact performance. There's view options here, which you can play with, but I think the default settings are fine. Then let's go to tablet. This is a very important option. 
If you're using a Wacom tablet or a Wacom equivalent tablet, then you're going to want to be using win tab mode here so that pen pressure works. However, if you're using something like a Surface Pro or a Microsoft Ink pen that's not a Wacom pen or a Wacom tablet, then you'll want to change this to RTS, real time stylus. Now, in order to change the tablet options, you need to restart Painter Essentials and open it again, and it'll apply those changes. We can also configure multi touch. If your tablet supports touch, you can use it to navigate. So you can turn touch on and off here. You can use Curl Painter Essentials multi touch, which only works with a Wacom device, or you can set it to Windows multi touch. So let's go ahead and test out how touch works. I'm going to turn touch on on my Wacom Cintiq 27. And then I'm going to pinch like so and twist to rotate my canvas. And that'll let me zoom in and out and pan my page. I can double tap with three fingers quickly just to reset my page. And that's how you can use touch to navigate Corel Painter Essentials. Moving on to the canvas menu, we can resize our canvas if we want to make our canvas bigger or smaller. We can look at the pixel dimensions here. We can also look at the inches. So right now this is 11 by 8.5, which is the standard print size that we chose earlier. Now I'm not going to get into image size and resolution because that's a whole other topic of discussion, but I do have a video that I'll link to down below that'll teach you more about print resolution. But just to show you what this can do, if I wanted to make my canvas smaller, let's say I want it to be four inches wide by three inches tall, I can do that and then it's much smaller now. I will mention that making your canvas smaller is going to throw away detail and information. So I'd make sure to save a copy before you make it smaller. And enlarging your canvas is only going to make those pixels blurrier or blockier. So enlarging is not really a good solution to make your artwork bigger. You should start with a bigger canvas to begin with. Back to the canvas menu, we have canvas size. And this is different than resize in that resize will take the image and it'll make it bigger or smaller. Whereas canvas size just adds canvas. Imagine if you had a canvas and you glued more canvas to the sides of it to make it bigger. The painting itself isn't getting bigger, but the canvas is. So I'll go ahead and add 100 pixels to the top of the canvas, and you can see that that added some canvas up there on the top and expanded it. Back to the canvas menu, we can rotate the canvas. This is different than rotating the view of the canvas. This is actually taking what was upright and then turning it. So if I go to rotate 90 degrees counterclockwise, this is now the default orientation of the canvas. So this is considered to be upright now. Going back to that rotate canvas menu, in addition to rotating it, you can also flip it horizontally, which is very helpful to give you a fresh perspective of your piece. It helps you look for flaws, and sometimes your artwork just looks better flipped. I'll flip it back, and we can also flip it vertically. In the canvas menu, we can also turn the tracing paper on and off for our cloning, which we looked at earlier. And we can set the paper color, which will tone our canvas, but we already know how to do that using the paint bucket if we want to. So let's move on to the layers menu. We can create a new layer, but we can also do that using the new layer button here, which I feel is easier. There's lots of other commands which are available in the layers palette as well, such as duplicating the layer, layer attributes, changing the order of the layers, selecting layers, collapsing or merging, which is fusing individual layers into a single layer. Very similarly, you can drop a layer all the way down to the canvas and fuse it with the canvas layer, or you can drop all the layers, which will turn a multi-layer document into a single layer document. And then of course you can delete layers. So as I mentioned, all that stuff can be found here. For example, we can tap and hold on this button here in the layers palette to collapse layers. If we do that, that apple now fuses with the canvas. If I create a couple more new layers here, I paint some yellow on one and some blue on the other. We select the yellow and we use that same collapse layers command. It's going to fuse the yellow with the blue together into a single layer. Now, if we do drop, that's going to jump it down to the bottom. So it's going to kind of skip behind the apple layer and fuse down with the canvas layer. So dropping will change the layer order. Now we can go up to that layers menu and we can do drop all. And again, that fuses all the layers into a single layer. We can get to some more hidden layer commands by right clicking. You can hold option and click if you're on Mac. We can choose the layer attributes for that layer. We can duplicate that layer if we want two of them. We can delete the layer. We can choose select layer content if we want to put a selection around that layer. This can be a very useful trick for adding tinting and glazing. For example, I can create a new layer now, set the composite method to multiply. And now if I paint, my paint is confined within that selection, but it's also tinting over that layer. Now if I go to select none, you can see exactly what that did. It's almost like I put a stencil over that paint and then I used a thin transparent ink to go over it and tint it. If you can remember any trick from this tutorial, remember that one because that is a very useful trick. 
So as you can see, that tinting is on its own separate layer. If it's too strong, I can reduce the opacity of it. If I don't like the way it blends, I can set it to something else. But either way, it gives me more control over my piece. And if I don't like it, I can even delete it. We can also lock layers if we're worried about accidentally painting on them. Let's go to the next menu, which is the select menu. We can select all, which will select everything that's on a layer. We can select none, which will deactivate a selection. I'm gonna choose one of these select tools here. Let's draw a custom selection. We'll go back to the select menu and we can invert that selection to turn it inside out. So now if we were to go and fill this selection, we'd be filling the outside of the selection. You can reselect an area. Float typically doesn't get used that much, so we won't worry about that. Feather can feather the edges of the selection to soften them. And then you can also widen, contract, smooth, and add a border to your selection. So that's it for the select menu. We'll move on to the effects menu now. I'm going to switch to a painting I made of a marble here. Let's go to the effects menu. The first option is apply surface texture. Surface texture is a canvas texture or the texture of the material that you're painting onto. So a canvas will have a canvas texture, watercolor paper will have a watercolor paper texture, and so on. This can help your artwork look more organic, but sometimes if overdone, it can also make your artwork look fake or synthetic. So don't overdo it. The texture you're going to get is going to be controlled by your paper, also known as a grain. So if I choose a different grain here, let's say French watercolor paper, then I get a different texture. If I choose small dots, then I get a dot texture. If you're going for an organic traditional look, you're probably going to want to choose something more natural. You're also going to want to reduce the amount pretty low to where you can just barely notice it. That way it doesn't ruin your piece. You can play with some of these other settings as well, but typically that's about all you need to do. If you want the light to be coming from a different angle, you can drag this little dot to move the light, or you can choose simple lighting and it just gives you more simplified options. If you want a top light, you can do that. And this gives us a little bit of texture. We zoom in really close, might be able to see that better. So that's one way to do it, but I'll show you another way that gives you a little bit more flexibility. I'm gonna undo to remove that texture. I'm gonna create a new layer. I'll call this layer texture. I'm going to set the composite method of that layer to overlay. Then I'm going to select a neutral gray, which is a gray that's just right in the center here. And I'm going to fill that layer with gray. Now, if you notice your canvas gets darker or lighter, you need to try to make sure that you get a more neutral gray so that you don't really see a change. Then we go back to effects, apply surface texture. I'll go ahead and make this really strong so that you can see what I'm doing as an example. And I'll apply the surface texture. Now, this didn't apply to the entire canvas. This applied only to that gray layer. And this gray layer is magical because this color works alongside the overlay composite method to basically turn that color of gray invisible. However, when you apply the effect to it of the texture, that adds light and dark, which does show up. So basically that texture is now on its own separate layer. And if I want to reduce the opacity of it, I can do that. If I want to hide it, I can do that. If I want to delete it, I can do that. And I don't have to worry about ruining my painting. I do recommend that when you're adding surface texture, you save a copy of your painting with and without the texture because you may come back later and decide that you don't need the texture if you're actually printing on top of a canvas that already has texture, so you don't want to be stuck with it. This texture can look kind of repetitive too, and so something you can do to kind of break it up is to maybe add multiple layers of texture, so I could create another new layer, can fill it with that same gray color, set the composite method to overlay, then I can go to effects surface texture. This time I'll pick a different texture. Let's try this other one here. Click OK, reduce the opacity, and now we have a couple of different layers of texture, which helps it look less repetitive. Now you can add these layers of texture at any time. You can add them before you start painting, or you can add them at the very end. In either case, just make sure to keep them separate. Make sure to not blend or paint on them accidentally. A good way to do that is to click the lock icon just to lock those texture layers. Here's another example of a self-portrait here. Let's go to effects and we'll try smart blur. Smart blur can kind of blur out certain areas of your painting while keeping others sharp. If we go to fill, then we can fill. This is very much like using the paint bucket. So we could fill with a color here if we want to. If we look under tonal control, there's a few different effects. The first is adjust colors. We can shift the hue, or we can desaturate it or add more saturation. We can make it darker or lighter and click on reset. There's also equalize. Equalize changes the light and dark values in your piece. This thing that looks like a mountain is called the histogram, and this represents the dark values in your piece over here on the left and the light values over on the right. So you can see there's a lot of dark in this piece because there's a big mountain here. There's a little bit of midtones, and then there's a little bit of light over here. 
So if we move these triangles in, that's going to create more dark. It's going to turn things that are almost dark into dark. And the opposite on the other side, things that are almost light into pure white. What that's going to do is that's going to start to throw away some information and you lose a lot of detail, plus it just looks kind of ugly. So you only really need to change this if your piece is too dark or too light, typically if it's too dark. But what you want to do is move these little triangles in to where they meet the edge of the mountain and not much further than that unless you need to. You can also play with the gamma, which is the midtones. So you can see doing something like that shows me a bit more detail. You can see a before and after with the preview here. And if you feel like that helps to brighten up your piece for printing, that's a good way to do it because sometimes things look really bright on screen, but then when you print them out, they look a lot darker. You can also use auto set. Sometimes that works fine. Back to effects, tonal control. We have brightness and contrast. It does a very similar thing. It can make it darker or brighter, but it doesn't quite give you as much control. Back to effects, tonal control. There's negative, that turns your colors inside out. Back to the effects menu, surface control, apply lighting, that can simulate lighting on your canvas. So for example, this is the angle of my light, dragging this little dot. This is the light source itself, so if I want this to look lit over here like this, I can do that. You can play with the color of the light and the brightness and all of these things to get a specific light. That's kind of the effect it gives you. Now this is a destructive edit, meaning that it actually made this image darker and lighter. So you may find that an easier way to accomplish that is to create a new layer, set the composite method to multiply, select black, choose a brush like an airbrush, like the soft airbrush, make a really big brush, and then just paint over here to add some darkness or some shadow. The advantage then is that this shadow is on its own layer, and if you're not happy with it, you can just delete that layer, or if it's too strong, you can reduce the opacity, and you have more control over it. Just as well, if you wanted to add a light spot, you could create a new layer, set it to screen, which is the opposite of multiply, and you could put in a big light over here on the side. I'll go ahead and just delete those layers. Let's go back to the effects menu, surface control. We've already looked at apply surface texture. It's color overlay, which can kind of tint your piece. It also uses the grain of the paper that you've selected, but you could change that to uniform color or image luminance or original luminance. There's also dye concentration and hiding power. You can just play with these effects if you want to. Now, typically I don't find these effects to be too useful. They're not really necessarily part of my painting process, so I'm not gonna go through all of these, but you can feel free to experiment with them if you like. Under focus, we have smart blur, which we looked at earlier, sharpen and soften. Sharpen can sharpen your piece, but it's probably gonna do more harm than good, so I wouldn't suggest using that. Soften can be very helpful if you wanna create kind of an out of focus effect you can control the amount of that focus. And then Esoterica Van Gogh is another one of those effects that I don't really use, but you can experiment with it if you like. We have the window menu, which has all the zoom and actual size stuff we looked at earlier. There's layouts that you can switch between if you want to arrange your workspace in different ways. We already looked at hiding the application and panels. We already looked at adding and removing panels here. Let's take a look at single document view. If we uncheck that, and it's going to show all of our open documents in their own windows. I don't really like that kind of view, so I prefer single document view. That way it just shows me one at a time, and if I want to switch between them, I can go to the window menu and I can switch here. Presentation mode will let us preview our artwork in a presentation mode. To exit, we press F11. So if we hit tab, then you can see that it shows us just our canvas and then our color picker here. I'll hit F11 to exit out of presentation mode. Really all that's doing is just hiding this top bar here. And then we have the help menu, which can take us to the quick start guide. There's tech support and all of these other help options here, which could be very useful for learning more about Curl Painter Essentials. And there's purchase for unlocking the trial if we want to purchase the full version of Curl Painter Essentials. So that's kind of a tour of all of the features that are available in Corel Painter Essentials. As I mentioned earlier, there's a lot more that would be available to you if you had the full version of Corel Painter. So that's definitely something to consider once you get used to working with Corel Painter Essentials, you may want to upgrade to the full version of Corel Painter. I have a coupon that'll let you save $100 off the full version of Corel Painter. There's a link to that in the description of this video. Now I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about how to paint with Corel Painter Essentials because I have a lot of tutorials about how to paint with Corel Painter. These tutorials were created with the full version of Corel Painter, but since Corel Painter Essentials has some of the features of the full version, you may be able to follow along watching those, or at the very least get some ideas about how to make a painting. 
Before I go though, I will however do a quick demo painting just to show you my workflow. So I'm going to go to new, I'll create a new canvas. I'm going to set my dimensions to inches because I want to be thinking about a standard print or frame size. I'll choose an 11 by 14 inch canvas. The resolution I'm going to choose for this is going to be 150, but you could choose any resolution you want. Anywhere between 72 and 300 is a standard resolution. The resolution is going to make your image more detailed if it's a higher number, but it could also make Corel Painter perform more slowly because it's going to use more of your computer resources. So you'll have to experiment with this number to see what works best for you. Now when I'm painting, I don't typically use the color set or the mixer. I use the layers and the color picker, so we'll keep those open. Now what I want to paint here is just a quick demonstration of an apple. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this to make it look realistic. I just want to show you the steps you can use to create a painting. So I don't want to do anything with my canvas layer other than maybe tone it so that it's not just white. So I could go either to Effects Fill, or I could use the Paint Bucket, or I could use Control F, which is the shortcut. I'll just fill that canvas layer, and that's just going to be my background color. I'll create a new layer on top of that, and let's call this Apple. I'm going to select a red hue, because I know apples are red sometimes, and I'll pick the saturation and the value that I want, maybe something like that. And then I'm going to use an acrylics and oil brush. Let's try Real Oils Filbert. And I'll just kind of paint in my apple shape here. I can make my brush bigger now and fill in more of the center. And it's up to you what kind of style you want to use for your painting. I'm going to do something kind of loose here. Now in the full version of Curl Painter, you would have an option to lock the transparency, which makes it really easy to do shading on objects without having to worry about painting on the background. We don't have that option here in Essentials, but there is a workaround. We can right click on that layer, choose Select Layer Content. That's going to only let us paint within the apple shape here. Now I can make my color a bit lighter and brighter, and I'll shift the hue a little bit, tiny bit towards yellow or orange. And if we decide we want our light coming from the top right, that's where we'll begin to add some highlight here, and I'll just kind of build that up with some strokes to add a light area that starts to kind of fade over into a dark area. I'm going to hold Alt, and I'm going to sample that base color that we put down first. I'll make that darker, less saturated, and I'll shift it a bit in the hue towards magenta. And over on this side, we'll put in a little bit of shading to make a shadow. We can just keep doing that, building that up darker and darker and lighter and lighter until we get the kind of result that we want. Just sample using Alt. Shifting the hue helps the color look more natural. Do a little bright spot there, and then nice white spot using a smaller brush there in the middle for the reflection on the apple. Then we can switch to a blender, let's say coarse oily blender, and we can blend that up a little bit. That helps kind of transition those colors together. And then let's switch to an airbrush. Let's go to Soft Airbrush. We'll sample some of our background color. We'll use a big brush to just kind of paint over here on the side. What this is going to do is this is going to add a little reflectivity to the apple, so it's reflecting its environment. Then I will go to Select None, or I could hit Control D to deactivate that selection. And now we have our three-dimensional painterly apple shape here. I want to do some more work on that, so I'll go back to my Real Oils Filbert. I'm going to sample one of these darker colors, just make it a bit darker. We'll have a little dimple in the apple here on the top where the stem comes out of. Let's put the stem on a new layer. That way if we're not happy with it, we don't have to repaint the apple. Make my color darker, a little bit more brown. Have our stem kind of come up like this. If we overpaint down here, we can just switch to our eraser and erase it so it looks like it's coming out of that hole. Now we can use that same trick where we right click on the stem layer, choose select layer content to put a stencil around that layer. Back to our brush. We could choose a greenish color like this for the top of the stem. And down towards the bottom of the stem, just a darker color. Deselect our active selection with control D. Now we have our stem. 
So that is a very, very basic painting process for how to paint something. Of course, if I wanted this to be a more realistic apple, I would spend a lot more time on it and probably use a lot more layers and more brushes. But this gives you an idea of how you can make a quick painting. So now before we go, let's take a look at how to save our painting. In case we ever want to come back to this and edit it or anything, we want to make sure that we save our layers. So to do that, we go to File, we choose Save As. I'm going to go ahead and save this as a Painter Riff, and this will be our master copy with all our layers. Now if we're going to want to print this or post it on the web, we're going to need to save a copy. So we'll go to File, Save As again, and this time we'll save a copy as a PNG for the web. If you needed to resize it first and make it smaller, you could certainly do that. Then we'll save a copy again by going to Save As, and let's save a TIFF for printing. So I'll call this one Apple Print. Now we have three versions of the file. We have our master copy, we have a version for printing, and we have a version for the web. So there you go. I hope that crash course in Corel Painter Essentials 6 was helpful. If it was, take a quick second to like this video. And if you're interested in learning more about painting with Corel Painter, subscribe to my YouTube channel or check out my courses on AaronRutten.com. As I mentioned earlier, Corel Painter Essentials has a lot of the same features that the full version of Painter has, so you should be able to follow along with some of my courses, although you won't have all the brushes and features that I'm using. When you're ready to upgrade to the full version of Corel Painter, make sure to use that coupon that's down in the video description to save $100 off the full version. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.